on today's video. I speak to Kim Baker. She works for Family Voice Surrey and she's also a parent of an autistic child called Matty. Kim works very hard at raising the understanding and awareness for autism and I was honoured when she agreed to take part of the Autism Connections. In this video we speak about what it was like growing up and the understanding of autism, we speak about her time in the police and the knowledge of autism and conditions within the police force, and we speak about Matty and his journey with autism and how Kim found the diagnosis stage for Matty. Hey guys and welcome to the first episode of series 2 of the special Maxi Aspie series, The Autism Connections. And as you can see by the introduction, I've got a very special guest on the show today. I've done speeches for her and worked with her very closely. Uh, she works for Vanley Voice Surrey, so please welcome Kim Baker. Kim, thank you for coming on the show today. It means a lot, obviously, speaking to you and having the chance to interview you today. I didn't think this one would be filmed but during lockdown as well. <laughs> uh, one we day, go. we'll do it in person. <laughs> exactly, one day. Um, but I, I'm going to start by asking the same question I asked everyone, which is, you know, what, what is your connection to autism? Okay, so I've got a nearly five-year-old um, little boy called Matty with autism. So that's um, one of my connections. Um, my other connection is that I work for a special needs charity called Family Voice Surrey. Um, we champion the needs of families in Surrey um, with children from 0 to 25 who've got any form of additional need, but autism is quite plays quite a heavy part in that um, in those needs, a lot of our families have got children with autism, ADHD. So those are my two connections, obviously the big one being my son. And I always say it's the parents that understand it the most, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I live, I live by that because they're the people that are at the forefront and living, living it day in, day out. Along, yeah. Along with the person that's got it. Yeah. Sometimes I sort of feel like I have it too in a way, but I don't, like I, I almost feel that's a bit of a disrespectful thing to say to people who do have autism because I'm I'm not I'm neurotypical um but because I'm always on the you know the lookout for the triggers and having to think in the way that Matty thinks to try and preempt things that could be a problem for him almost feels like a, it's like an additional need for me as well in some way I mean personally I I wouldn't find that offensive because I think <laughs> you know my mum you know I, I, I think if my mum said I've got autism, I'd probably go, no, you ain't mum. But I would definitely <laughs> acknowledge that if there's anybody, anybody out in the world that, that has it, you know, just as much as myself, it would be my mum. That's it. There's no book, is there? It's like someone burnt all the parenting autistic books and just went, yeah, I had to deal with it. Now you're, yeah, you know. I've, I've read a lot and I do read a lot because it, it's, it's a special, you know, it's a passion of mine as well and I would like to retrain to work with um I'd, I'd love to retrain to be speech and language therapist so i do a lot of research and i'm actually doing a diploma in special needs so there is a lot of information out there and there's some brilliant stuff and then there's some stuff that's just not practical um that's just not necessarily doable there's some i just actually read if it's a fictional book but i think it's based on real circumstances it's called can you see me now i don't know if you've heard of it um it's about a girl who, an autistic 11 year old girl who's just started secondary school um, and just sort of her way of navigating through that, which is, you know, a massive deal for anyone starting secondary school. It's a fictional book, but at the end of each chapter, she's got, um, she'll write like an autism fact, like so she'll put in there about um, demand avoidance and stimming and um, a few other bits and bobs and then like the pros and cons of those things. And then she has like top tips for parents and stuff in it. So it, although it's a fictional book, it, it's so good. And it, you could read it as an autistic teenager or you could read it, you know, just for your own entertainment. I, I, I poured through it and I'm, I, I'm almost annoyed that I read it so quickly because it's, it's over now. But I, like, I made a few notes of my favourite quotes in there because I just I just found I just 
found it absolutely fascinating. One of the things that she says in there is, I think that a lot of the negative traits of, of autism are not negative, those traits that make them negative. So it, she was talking about stimming in that circumstance. So she said she hides her stims in public. Um, so she's like hand flapper, clapper, squealer, like Matty's a very vocal stimmer. So while he's four, it's fine because a lot of four-year-olds make those kinds of noises. If he's doing it when he's 12, it's a bit different and he might, you know, he might struggle with people's reactions to him. Um, but what the girl was saying in this book is she tries to stop her flapping in public and at school and instead she then reverts to harmful stimming. So she'll like pinch her skin and bite her, bite her nails and all of those things. And that it's people's reactions to the good stim that causes her to do the bad stim. Um, I just found it really interesting. I think you're dead right. I mean, while you were saying that, and I thought, like, even to myself, I was thinking, okay, so what's the sort of bad stim? And you're right, you know, um, I bite my nails. Like, I've got no nails because I bite them, you know. I, I yeah. have them. Um, and I just think that's like a subconscious thing that I've done. But over the yeah. years, I think it's right, you know, you, you sort Compensating of... Compensating for what you you know perhaps would have done in a different way Matty's stim he's he's quite a noisy stimmer um so he he sniffs does a lot of this even though he doesn't need to blow his nose so it's always quite obvious what his stim is and he's a he's a big chewer as well so he's always got um he's always biting his clothes but he's got a lego chew so he'll try and do a bit of that but um he happy flaps and he like I can see when he's getting excited, but it's also a sign of him getting anxious as well. So we have a happy flap and a sad flap. So I can identify the difference. Yeah. As I say, it's different when, when they're young, these behaviours kind of fall into what most people would find socially acceptable for a four year old anyway. So um, we do get a lot of public stares, absolutely. Um, but we're not na I'm not navigating that whilst he's 10, obviously yet, but we will have to do that and we'll, yeah, because I remember in primary school, I used to always, I'd bite the sleeve of my... Yeah, his jumpers are destroyed. <laughs> and it's, it's, yeah, I mean, just speaking about it now, you know, you're right, when you grow up, I think there was probably the occasion where I did do that and someone noticed, like, oh, what's that on your sleeve? And, you know, people are a little bit like, oh, that's disgusting. And then you sort of stop doing that and then, yeah, you start reverting to the other sort of harmful stims, as you said, because it compensates for for the, the good ones, you know? I suppose my, my next question for you then was, yeah, what was it like growing up for yourself? Um, and did you ever think or feel that you had any conditions? And did you hear about, did you hear a lot about conditions while, when you were growing up like autism, PDA, OCD? So I'm 35. Um, I suffered a lot with anxiety as a child, um, still do now, um, but I had, very bad anxiety as a teenager at school um as a result of a number of different things it would say it's quite reactive anxiety um and i was quite badly bullied at school as well so that the two kind of went hand in hand i don't think i would have been aware of the term autism at school we have all been guilty of using the term i'm a bit ocd which i now very much try not to use um but i am a person who likes things neat and tidy and clean but not from an ocd perspective it's just because it helps i just that's just how i like things done a bit of a moniker from friends that kind of side of things at school we were aware of children who perhaps struggled and i can remember a particular girl and i always think about this girl now who was so clearly autistic um, from college. It was when we were in college. She still ate um, baby food. She'd never, like, she st struggled with the texture and stuff. And everybody just thought she was weird. And I, I imagine at school, she probably got bullied. When you're in college as a teenager at 17, 18, and I actually was there when I was 19, I, I did it a bit later. Um, there was less focus on singling her out because she was weird and more of a curiosity. She was in a couple of my lessons. She did psychology with us and she did communications um, with us. And we had to do a recorded presentation. And 
so that it can be sent off to the examiners for our A-levels. And when the video was turned on, she just, bless her heart, absolutely lost it. She just couldn't manage it at all. And we were just really concerned for her welfare. Now, would I have labelled it autism when I was 19? No, 100% not. It's only with hindsight that I now realise that that's what that was. Um, I'd love to find her now and see, like, was she diagnosed when she was that age and she just didn't talk about it? Or, or has she found out as an adult? Maybe she still doesn't even know now and she's struggling through life, not understanding that she doesn't fit in. Um, and we just try to, like, we asked her what would make her feel comfortable, like who, who would she have in the room to watch her presentation? And we wouldn't record it, but we did. And we just kind of turned the camera on. So, because she needed to do it for, for A-level, she had to do it. Cool. So cool. we did what we could to try and make her feel as comfortable as possible. Um, but there were, I went to a, a secondary school that really focused and praised on very academic children. Um, and I'm very lucky to be quite academic myself. Um, so, I would have done that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there wasn't like I remember there being a room for children who went to who struggled with like English and maths, and um, but there was a a term that would have been used for people of my generation for children that came into school who probably had quite severe learning disabilities and then they came in on the bus and it was referred to as the sunshine bus. Now, I don't really, and it, let's be honest, it was meant as a, it was meant as a derogatory thing. Very embarrassed to admit that that is what we all knew it as now. And I would, I would never refer to anything like that now, but that is what it was referred to of, of my generation when I was, so we're talking 20 years ago when, from when I was at school, oh, makes me feel old. Um, but no, I don't think I heard the term autism until I, um, I my history career-wise is, is in policing. Um, and we had a training input on autism. Um, I started off my career working on the front desk of the police station. So I was a station officer. And we had an input on autism. So this is uh, 15 years ago now, 15 years ago that I joined there. And... Um, we had this in, input from a lady who had a, a number of different conditions. She had Tourette's and, you know, picked up, a, you know, as you do, pick up a few different diagnoses along the way. And I remember listening to this input from her and I was fascinated. And this is before I was married and had my son myself, so it was years ago. And I was absolutely fascinated by this um, this lady and this input and I was really interested in and I really wanted to know more about it and I um, just was always keeping an eye out for people with additional needs who come into contact with the police which happens a lot um, and then as my career progressed um, I became a, an antisocial behaviour officer um, and a number of the teenagers that I worked with um, would have had a lot more so ADHD than autism um, but there were definitely some individuals had, who had autism and I became very aware of needing to work out the best way to work with them to not criminalize them and not set them up to fail by putting so it was would have been putting aspos and stuff I mean that, that terminology doesn't exist now but that's what it was when I was there in that role not just chucking an aspo at an antisocial behavior at an antisocial teenager and setting them up to fail because that just wouldn't have been the right thing to do and so that that's where my interest so I always had a massive interest in autism way before I even thought about having children and I read this fascinating book I, my, one of my favorite authors is Jodie Pickle and um, she wrote a book called House Rules and it's about um, a lad who's I think he's like 18 or 19 uh, again it's a fictional book and he like his special interest is like crime and CSI and those kinds of things and he gets himself involved I won't delve too I won't give too much of it away because anyone wants to read it because it's such a good book but he gets himself involved in a crime and he ends up going through the criminal justice system 
And there's so many phrases from that book that I remember. And one of the one of the phrases that he says in it is um, the first time I went into a doctor's surgery and they told me to take a seat, I went into the reception area, I picked up a seat and took it back in to the, sorry, went to the waiting room, picked up the chair, took it back into the reception area and I was like, well, what do you want me to do with this? And it's, just, I just love that because it's so literal. Like I'll say to Matthew, can you walk back to mummy? And he walks backwards. Um, to, you know, he does such literal things and he calls a bath bomb a fizz egg and, um, he was asking me for noisy pasta the other day. I was like, what is noisy pasta? I like, couldn't figure it out. What is noisy pasta? And I showed him pictures of lots of different types of pasta and it's the big thick pasta tubes because you can blow through it and make a noise. And I was like, that was really clever. Like you're only not even five and you've already labeled the term noisy pasta. So I always think back to these little things that I've kind of learned along the way. And, so I went in a massive round circle then. So in conclusion, I had no real awareness of it at school. It was, I would say I, it was in my very early twenties and that was through my career path that I became aware of autism um, and was fascinated by it and still am. And do you think like, obviously you, you sat by you had a really good successful career and really understood it. Do you think like fellow police officers and the the police there understood it as much as what they could have um i think it's getting better um so surrey police which is where i worked um, and i would imagine there's an equivalent for other police forces have a system called pegasus and i i don't know if it's the same terminology in other police forces but if you've got special needs or your class is disabled um you can register on pegasus so it will have your information, your emergency contacts, what your diagnosis is, if you're verbal, nonverbal, those kinds of things. Um, and you get given a pin number. So if, for ex you know, if God forbid, so when Matty's a teenager, I will 100% sign him up. If God forbid, if he had to contact the police, he would just say, I'm on Pegasus, my pin is 1234. The information would auto populate in front of the call handler so that they would know that they were dealing with somebody with autism. And so that, scheme has come in in the time because i spent 13 years in police and i took a career break two years ago um so that information has that that system has come in um we're also really lucky that the the sorry police have, has got a forced lead on the, the autism lead they would call him so he does a lot of awareness training he's got an autistic child himself and um pre-covid we did some uh, autism awareness days for um, families with uh, children with autism or just additional needs so we did like four sessions throughout the day so there were only 50 people that came up so they came up to headquarters they got a chance to have a look at like the Nino cars and try some uniform on register on pegasus have a look at uniform and handcuffs and stuff and so just give them a bit of awareness about policing because some will find it really fascinating some will find it really intimidating and we wanted to make sure that the open day was accessible for everybody because the other open days that had been done in the past would have thousands of people there and it's just too much so we did it on a much smaller scale it was timed it was ticketed they were allowed parking all of those things and, and ben set that all up uh, so he is definitely um making strides in making officers from surrey police aware of autism so he delivers a package i've helped with it in the past um, and I also offer free autism awareness training to like local councils and stuff. So I will deliver it on, I can do it on, on Zoom to YMCA. All of this was all set up I mean, before COVID. So it's a little bit on hold, but um, so I sort of deliver a very similar package to Ben that we've worked on together. And I credit him in that because he's helped me put a suitable presentation together. That's not, but how, how do you tell people about autism in an hour and a half? I, I could talk about it for days um and how it relates to the particular role and their work environment um so we talk about things in policing to think about safe restraint as well um because if you if a, a person an autistic person was having a meltdown and you weren't aware of that as a police officer your immediate reaction would be to restrain them because it looks like they're being um, a risk to themselves or to other people. I'm thinking like a violent meltdown. 
So just getting them to have a little think about the best way for safe restraint if that was needed and actually that would be the worst thing you could do. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we're getting there. I think we're much more aware of it than we used to be. Um, and I still get colleagues who message me and say like, can I just run something by you with your, cause they, I'm very vocal about the fact that I'm an autism mum and um, still have contacts within the police. So I think we're getting there. Um, well, as always, these things could be improved. I suppose, you know, my next question would be as well, you know, with, with Matty, I mean, what, what was like, what was the diagnosis um, stages like for you? You know, did you find it hard to get a diagnosis? Did you, you know, how, how did that kind of come around for, for yourself? Um, it, it wasn't easy, um, but in the grand scheme of things, I, I've heard many worse stories than ours. Um, when he was 18 months old I started to think something's not quite right here um it, it was more evident in kind of social situations he was always quite late with milestones like he sat up quite late he crawled late he lost skills so he learned to clap and to wave and then he just stopped doing it um he was always like if I took him to play groups and stuff he'd just cling to me he just wouldn't want to go off he had, always used to put his hands over his ears and like lots of very kind of obvious signs lining toys up very funny with food awful sleeper um and i i'm denied about it a lot and i tried to contact our health visitor um very unsuccessfully and essentially when i did finally get hold of them they just refused to see him until his 27 month check so now they do a check at six weeks and a year or nine months to a year and then again at two the funding was non-existent when Matty was one so there was no one year check so we didn't see a health visitor from when he was six weeks to his 27 month checks so they do this two-year check but they do it three months after their two so it ends up being 27 months and you you get this questionnaire that's got 30 questions on it so it's split into five different categories and he scored six out of 30 that was all he was able to do in the um skill set so it would be like you know gross motor skills social communication any signs of toileting eating sleeping eye contact all of those kinds of things that would go through a diagnostic criteria and he only yeah he could only do six out of the 30. I asked the health visitor for help and she said we basically we just don't really do anything until they're over two because they might catch up. I was like okay I, I, I can understand but is there anything that I can do in the meantime to try and support him? I'm massively passionate about early intervention and I really wanted to, to kind of do some strategies with him if there was something that I could do to support him. The health visitors were useless so I went straight to my GP and she could see what I was seeing and was lovely and referred for an assessment to the paediatrician, to the community paediatricians, which was rejected on the basis that there was no evidence. And she said, I will do this so that his name goes into the system, but I'm warning you, it's likely that it will be rejected. So the first one was rejected and then we did it again after his 27 month check where he only scored six out of 30 again they rejected it um, because there was no evidence so I was really lucky I worked part-time and I've got he's got two sets of very lovely grandparents who wanted to look after him while I was at work so he didn't go to a nursery um, but after that I thought okay let's get him into a nursery so we can start because obviously mum's word is not enough they need to hear it from somebody else so we started him off in a nursery it took him a very very long time to settle into that nursery um, and once he was settled we referred again with some of their evidence and it was rejected again because they said still they didn't have enough evidence so i'm saying okay so what do you need for evidence and they're saying well you, you need some intervention okay so what do you need for intervention we well, need evidence and i'm like I, are you serious? <laughs> yes. Do you realise how backwards what you're saying is? So very fortunate that I was able to pay for a private speech and language therapist who wrote a fantastically comprehensive report. And the this was a private nursery. Um, they got in a, um, she's called a senior send advisor, 
and she wrote a report. So I had that plus the speech and language report. And then I wrote a massively lengthy report and I called to the paediatrician's office and I said, I will not stop phoning you until you agree to assess my son, because I am telling you he has got an additional need. And they finally agreed. So fourth time lucky, um, they agreed to assess him. We had to wait another four months and they assessed him just before his third birthday. So one month before his third birthday. And he had a multidisciplinary assessment um, and he was diagnosed on the day. Um, because he's autistic, he's so clearly autistic, I knew he'd be diagnosed on the day and they, he, they saw exactly what they needed to see. That was started the ball rolling and he got a place in a special needs uh, preschool. So he did what they call his minus one year in a SEND setting and then COVID hit. So he did from September to March in this setting and then obviously had um, lockdown off he went back to nursery about may time um and they mixed the mainstream children from that nursery with the special needs children so that they could accommodate more children and actually that he really benefited from having contact with mainstream children and um he came on leaps and bounds in that process did his ehcp and got him a place in a specialist provision for school which he started in september last year so so it was it was long and complicated but i was determined and i didn't stop and i made a nuisance of myself and i wasn't prepared to back down i know lots of families who've been waiting more than two years for the diagnosis who've had assessments and are still waiting for diagnosis because they perhaps didn't see what they needed to see on the day but perhaps your children who mask or whose needs are perhaps not quite as high. So he was still nonverbal at the time as well. So he was nearly three and, and nonverbal, but not just nonverbal, non-communicative. Um, the children who've perhaps grasped language a bit earlier and who mask quite well are going to struggle through that diagnostic process. And, you know, I thank, so I thank God that he was diagnosed before he was three because that, that started that ball rolling. So, yeah, it wasn't easy, but I just wasn't prepared to back down. No, I think you've given some really good like tips as well to to parents <laughs> who are going. Be a pain, them. yeah. You know, just I, don't be, yeah. Don't be afraid to be that parent, and I'm not, and I still am, and I will always be that parent, the one that they go, oh gosh, Mrs. Baker's on the phone again. I, oh well, <laughs> it's my son, and I will be a, a, as big a pain as I need to be to get what he needs, but not just what he needs, what he deserves because every child deserves the absolute best chance at education and he just needs more support to access that. So he's going to get it. No, of course. And I always say as well, if we can't get it right at this level, then it's like a knock on effect at every other level. You know, so when they go to secondary school, yeah, they've not got the support they yeah. need. Then they've not got the support they need here. Yeah. It's like <laughs> you're sort of behind. Um, yeah. so you can get it, you know, I said to someone the other day, like the way that I think it should be done is every child is just, every child should just be deemed that they've got everything and it should be. You must cross it off the list. Yeah, you don't have that. You don't have that. Yeah. Yeah. This system where it's like we deem them to have nothing, you know, like when the baby's born, mm. we, we check, okay, are they breathing? Okay. Do, yeah. okay we check all these things. But the mental health side of things, none of it gets checked. Yeah, you know? and yeah I, that's a very valid point. And, I, and I, I guess it's because they're too young and things like that. But throughout the years, if you if you went through the approach that they deemed that everyone had something as soon as they were born, you'd have that early intervention for any cause. Yeah. And, and you'd be able to access those formal diagnoses a lot quicker. Because it would be well, right. One of the things I bang on about as well is that it, one of the things I bang on about a lot is that whatever you do to support children with additional needs in a, in a school setting what is only going to benefit mainstream children because they also learn you know that it helps them to learn they all respond to visuals they all respond to um, timetables and calendars and at a slower pace obviously those children that are really academically gifted will need 
a little bit more input. You'll be able to identify that. But by teaching all children as if they were autistic or, if, or as if they had an additional need, they're all going to benefit. But if you teach all children as if they were mainstream, you're going to section off a population of that school. So what is it like? I think it's 25% of children in a mainstream some form of additional need, be that mild dyslexia to severe autism. So you're immediately cutting off 25% of your students if you only teach in a mainstream way. So why are we not just teaching as if all of our children have got an additional need? Well, it shows in the exclusion rates as well. I mean, it's uh, yeah. exclusion rates for autistic people is at its highest. Um, Terrifying. You know, it shows when we go into employment, there's only 16% of people in full-time work with autism. So it shows that there are, as you say, big sections of not only education, but also the workplace that are getting cut off. I suppose that leads to my next question as well. Like, do you feel like you've got support from the, the schools and the government? The school, yes. Um, the government, no. Um, the school are fantastic. I can't really fault them. I, I, there's been a few little things here and there, but um, nothing dramatic. They, throughout lockdown, the ELSA, so for those of you who might not know, it stands for um, Emotional Learning Support System, I think is the, the acronym called um and said like it, uh, we're just making contact with all of our families we understand this is a really difficult time and children's mental health is and well being um affected and we want to see if there's anything that we can do to support you i was just like even just phoning me is enough like just to acknowledge that we're all suffering a little bit um we've had contact from the homeschooling worker i have regular chats with his teacher um, we have a good open dialogue because Matty is a masker so he's a totally different child at school and presents in a completely different way um, and they're really keen to have a very open dialogue with uh, with me about what what he does outside of school um, so that they can be aware of any triggers and stuff but it's just important for them to know so that and I always feel very listened to by them um, from the government no I'm um, I feel they left us behind and let us down during lockdown. Um, he's got six cousins who he adores and he really struggled not seeing them um, and not seeing my mum in particular. He's very close to all his family. He has a very, very close bond with my mum. And he just didn't understand that he couldn't see her. And then even when restrictions started to lift and he was able to see her in the garden, he didn't understand why she couldn't come in the house. So actually that almost made it worse. Now I get, absolutely get that we had to follow those rules to keep everybody safe, but they didn't think about the support bubble idea until quite a bit later, did they? Um, the other thing that was difficult for us is, okay, yeah, we could go outside for a walk, but this kid is like walking Google maps. So he knows where the parks are that are closed. He knows where the swimming pool is that's closed. He knows where his nana lives that he can't go to. So our local walks are completely out of bounds for us where there's so many triggers for him locally, we just couldn't take it out. So I think it was a couple of months into it, they made a restriction, uh, sorry, a special dispensation for families of, with disabled children that you could take a short car journey so that opened up a huge world for us that we could go and drive to a woods. So there's no local trip, there's no triggers because he doesn't know where this place is. He know, we know there's no park. Um, there's not likely to be as many people around, a bit nervous of dogs. So it, it made things a lot easier for us. But I just feel like the effect it would have on children and on families um, and the longer term impact that that has on relationships and um your mental health and well-being and everything so yeah uh, no i don't feel the government supported us but the school did hugely what was it like as well i suppose with the with the home learning during covid do you think matty benefited through i suppose the the home learning you do you think he'd done better at home than what he would have done at school or no um so lockdown one he was at nursery so there was no real pressure 
to complete anything. They sent us an activity every day. Um, and I started off like a lot of parents with my special timetable. We're going to do this. And I think after half an hour, I threw it on the floor and turned the TV on. Um, so we just survived lockdown one. We just did what we needed to to survive. It was so much easier to be outdoors. We had the paddling pool out, you know, trampolines, ice creams all day long. Fine. Um, Fortunately, because his class is a rumble child, he was able to go to school during the second one that started after Christmas for isolation, where one of the children in his class caught COVID. So he, we did do 10 days of home learning and it was 10 days that aged me a lot. It was very, very hard. Um, and it was only 10 days. So I take my hat off to the parents who were doing it for two, three months or, and longer. Um, he would not remotely entertain um, writing or anything with me um, and it, we just fought all week. It was so hard. Um, so I'm very glad that we made the choice to send him in. Um, my husband works outdoors predominantly so we felt that like the risk of him catching it and passing it to Matty and passing it into anybody at school was, was pretty low. I'm not working. Um, I work for this charity, but it's all online. And we had con no contact with anybody else. So we felt that our risk level was, was low. Um, and actually the benefit to Matty far outweighed um, the risk in honesty for us um, was more of a factor. Um, they, there's nine children in his class uh, and there was four in at the time. And he really benefited from having that small class of four. Yeah, by the sounds of it, it was definitely the, the the right decision as well. And I, I right, I think if you look at, I I felt quite let down by the government. I mean, you look at the statistics as well of the the amount of people that died with with um, disabilities. It almost well, it did. It doubled last year. It it was just I think there was a lot that could have been done that that wasn't, um, and a lot of things that came late. Um, you know not just for people with conditions but just for the general public as well you know you mm -hmm. can't promote eat out to help out and then blame everyone for the spread of, of the illness again you know it's a bit of a, a bit of a catch-22 situation yeah and we we struggled a bit like over the summer where some things were open but not everything was open so Matty can't understand that if you go to uh, for example, we went to like a caravan holiday. So, um, you know, on the complex, there's there's a park, there's an arcade, there's a swimming pool, there's this, there's the other, and not all of it was open. So, it, I, it was just I was just on eggshells all the time, waiting for the thing that was going to tip him over the edge because he doesn't doesn't get queuing, and you've, everyone's got to stand two meters apart. He doesn't get that. Um, you know, he doesn't understand that he's not allowed to, to touch things. He loves shopping, he loves going into shops and just touching things and picking things up. He doesn't get that he can't do that. So in some ways for us, it was, it's almost better to be all or nothing. Like, you know, we can't, if he doesn't have it, he doesn't know that he can't. Um, but if, if we go out and he's like, I have to take special routes home from school because if we walk past the library at the moment, it upsets him because he wants to go inside the library. We can't go inside the library because it's shut and he doesn't understand that it's not shut. So you're constantly thinking about detouring. You know, I'm always like planning my route in my head. Are we going to go past McDonald's? Because I can't, I'm always going to want a Happy Meal. And that was obviously closed for forever. And, you know, we can't drive past this place. We can't do that because it's shut and he can't go in and he doesn't get that he can't go in. So it's, yeah, it was really difficult, really, really difficult. What do you feel the biggest issue around autism is? And if you could explain autism, how would you explain it? I, I'll answer the second question first, because this is I would explain it in two ways. So to children, I say Matty's brain works a bit differently and he's still learning how to share, talk, play, whatever the thing is, and that he needs help um, to learn. So my niece is um, said to me quite a while ago now, so she would have been four at the time, my youngest niece. 
she said to me, Kim, Auntie Kim, what do you understand about autism? And I was like, oh, how long have you got? You know, <laughs> and um, I said, tell you, tell me, what do you understand about autism? And she said, I don't think Matty's being naughty. I think he just doesn't understand. Um, and to, for, to hear that from a four year old. Now, this little girl also got star of the week because she helped the children at school who don't like noise. And she told me that it was the, the children like Matty who need help with learning. And I honestly, I have never been so proud in my whole life because I was just like, I'm getting that message through. So to explain it to adults, I would say um, autism is um, certain people are just d designed not to fit in this world. So this world is not set up for them. They are, you know, this world does not accommodate for them the things that they need um, and that their yeah that their brain works differently um that they're different and differences should be celebrated and accepted i think the biggest problem or biggest issue with autism is around awareness and acceptance and i am very vocal about um my son being autistic um, I'm very proud to be very vocal about it. On his push chair, he's got signs that I hang off the side that say, please be patient, I'm autistic. I wear the sunflower lanyard. I tell everybody who wants to listen to me that he's autistic. Because I think that if they can see him displaying a certain kind of behaviour that perhaps they would think is not acceptable, if you like, um, and they know he's autistic then they understand why he's behaving in that way and then if they see another child doing it they'll understand that it's it's because they've got some additional need and they're not going to pass that judgment on it now it's not because i care what people think trust me i don't i've worked in policing for 13 years on very thick skin i couldn't care what people think but i do care for his sake because i don't want people to think that he's a naughty child or that i'm a bad mum because that's not the case at all I think we have a huge part to play in raising the bar on autism acceptance and awareness and that it's just the norm. And this is why I um, talk, so we talk so openly about it with our family. Um, my eldest nephew, so he would have been like 10 at the time and said to me, oh, why Kim, I let the boy behind me in the queue for the canteen at school have the last piece of pizza because I know he's autistic and I didn't want him to get upset. Now, he'd never have done that if he didn't know about Matty because I'm not going to give the last piece of pizza up for anyone. Uh, you know, that's an incredible amount of awareness and empathy. So he's going to tell his friends who are going to tell their friends, who are going to tell their cousins, who are going to grow up with that acceptance and pass it on to their children so that the next generation have got this incredible awareness and acceptance of autism and special needs and that it's just some people are just different and that's okay and um, we should celebrate our differences and never be embarrassed about public behavior which trust me we get a lot of I've you know carried him side plank out of places screaming and shouting many times and I'm sure I will for years to come um, but he's not naughty he just finds it hard and um, get a bit emotional because I'm so proud of him and I can remember talking with my husband about children before we you know before we even had him and I can remember saying god I can't imagine it you know having an autistic child would be really really hard and um, I always feel like that <laughs> came to bite me in the bum a little bit but um, I wouldn't have him any other way and I feel so incredibly proud to live this journey with him and try and make a difference for him and for the next generation of autistic children because they're incredible so incredible he teaches me so much like more than i teach him he has taught me so much patience patience that i never thought i knew and never thought i needed to know um and i'm yeah i'm very proud of him i'll just stop there because i'm getting a bit choked up <laughs> yeah, I, I think yeah I mean, I think, yeah, I, I just, it's, I think it's just such a nice like, story. And I think as well, I've always said, you know, 
not only obviously you're lucky to have him but also you know he's he's lucky to have you as, as a mum and I think you're right you know the world needs to start adapting around autistic people and people with conditions and disabilities instead of these people feeling that they need to uh, adapt to the world that they feel that they don't fit in but all I want to say is thank you for for coming on and, and giving me your pleasure time. and um yeah but thank you ever so much Kim my pleasure anytime